but there's been a lot of challenges to Son of Sam laws that people aren't, anybody here in this room knows, any, anybody ever heard of a Mary Kay Letourneau? Yeah. Yeah. Who's Mary Kay Letourneau? Yeah. Okay, you get uh, some Swedish fish for, the, <laughs> for that answer. I'm, I'm pretty good at flinging, so catch the Swedish fish. Congrats. Mary Kay Letourneau, for all intents and purposes, let's be real here, is a convicted child molester, right? That's what she is, right? She's not some bookish school teacher. And when she was convicted, part of her judgment said she could not sell her rights for books and movies. Well, guess what happened? The Washington State Supreme Court overturned the judge's order barring her from profiting. Hence, that's why you have book written by Mary Kay Letourneau. It also happened again. Is anybody here old enough besides me to remember Frank Sinatra Jr.? Frank Sinatra Jr. was a kidnap victim, right? He was kidnapped, abducted, taken, and you know, put in some you know, godforsaken place. The kidnappers were caught, convicted, served their sentence. After they got out, Showtime offered the two kidnappers half a million dollars for the rights to their story called Snatching Sinatra. Frank Sinatra Jr. sued under the California Son of Sam statute. It went all the way up to the California State Supreme Court, who ruled in favor of who? Who'd they rule in favor of? <laughs> Columbia Pictures and the two kidnappers. So Son of Sam laws that are on the books have been challenged in every single one of them have been overturned. And one of the reasons that they're overturned is because most courts frown on any language restricting what? Freedom. Free speech, correct. And I'll get into how I started countering the issue of free speech. So I'll tell you how I stumbled upon this pretty much like everything else in my life, it's a total fluke. I, I grew up in upstate New York mostly, seen enough snow, shoveled it to last a lifetime. So I was perusing through a Rochester paper, and it was a little blurb about a New York serial killer's art privileges rescinded, because they found out the prison officials discovered he had artwork for sale on eBay. And it intrigued me. And every, I don't have to explain what eBay is like I used to many years ago. So I, it, it intrigued me. And in my warped and demented mind, I figured where there was one, there had to be what? Many others. So I clunked a search in for serial killers and items came pouring out. I was, I was absolutely dumbfounded. I said, no, wait a second, you can't be doing this. You can't be selling your personal stuff. You can't be putting this in nobody. And I'm like, no way. I contacted eBay's public affairs person who got to know me rather well for the next few years. And he very succinctly put it like this. You know, Andy, we're not the morality police. As long as it's legal, we have an obligation to offer to our customers, and you don't like it, feel free to do something about it. I said, okay. Well, as a friend of mine said, they had no idea what they were about to embark themselves in. So I came up with this cool, catchy phrase uh, that's kind of caught on called murderabilia to describe the industry, and we started talking about murderabilia, and the word actually caught on because about I want to say five or six years ago, I got an email from Webster's Collegiate Merriman Dictionary saying, uh, congratulations, uh, the word that you coined is now in a dictionary and don't create any more new words, so good for you. So that's, and if you ever want to know how a word ends up, a new word, it's by usage, word of mouth. So after a year of doing and getting the word out about murderabilia, that's how they ended up with a new word, and as my son said, well, this beats the time you were in the National Enquirer, so, yeah. <laughs> so I immersed myself into this issue. I decided I was gonna take it on. I was, you know, I, from where I sit, I serve on the board of parents of murdered children and surviving family members of homicide. I've been dealing with homicide survivors for over 25 years. We meet every month, so I've, and I can tell you from a victim's perspective, there's nothing more nauseating and disgusting than to find out the person who murdered one of your loved ones now has items being hawked by third parties for pure profit. 
It's like being gutted all over again by our criminal justice system. And I just wasn't going to sit back and pretend this wasn't happening. So I'd, I decided I was going to take it on. So I actually, for full disclosure, I needed to learn about the industry because nobody knew about it. it nobody even knew this was going on. So I, I became an avid buyer in the market, and we'll, we'll get into all this stuff later. I wanted to know who the dealers were, how they operated, how they did everything. So I would send them some innocuous emails. You know, gosh, this devil guy is quite scary. How did you get this from him? Love, Chrissy. And they would, you know, they would, they would respond to me. I became so well known as a buyer, I would get first dibs from the dealers before they put their items out on the public market. Then I decided, you know what, I pretty much accumulated what I needed to get, and I decided I'm going to out the industry. And how was I going to do that? I know how to use the media probably better than anyone as a victim advocate. And nobody knew this was going on, and I knew this was like gold. <laughs> 